Australian of the Year last year and one of our leading psychiatrists working with young people. Over to you, Pat. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I start your holiness by saying um, how grateful I am for this opportunity to, to talk with you today. It, it's, um, it's, a, it's just a very rare privilege. And what I'd like to do is, is tell you a little bit about my work and the work of my colleagues in Australia um, and around the world, actually, in this area. Um, and I, I thought what we talked about earlier, about compassion, um, that's perhaps a good place for me to start because um, as a young man, I think um, that's what drew me to work in the mental health field. Um, you know, I, I um, had this feeling about people with serious mental illness when I was a, a medical student and uh, they, um, they were getting a very raw deal. They have a very bad deal from our health system and uh, what I saw was more harm was done than good um, to them. And these are, these are people with serious mental illnesses, psychoses, schizophrenia, that severe spectrum. And I, I had the opportunity when I began training in psychiatry to work with um, young people who were experiencing their first episode of psychosis. And you talked about reality before. Well, these young people were having a major break with reality and their lives were in very bad shape. And um, they were surrounded in a treatment system um, by, I would say, clouds of pessimism and, and uh, no hope at all for them, really. It was like, like a catastrophe at work. And um, the concept of schizophrenia was a hopeless diagnosis uh, from which, you know, if you did recover, well, the diagnosis was changed. You know? <laughs> so it was, um, it was a very negative environment. And also the people being treated in 19th century, you know, institutions. And uh, so um, I suppose... Who, who was that So, so the first thing I th that we had to do was to introduce some optimism and hope into, into the equation. And so we, we took the idea of early intervention, you know, so, so um, in other words, trying to pick up these problems as soon as they appear, because many of these young people had been sick for years before they got any mm -hmm. help. And um, their lives were in ruins at a time when um, they should have been flourishing, they should have been developing as people, their brains are developing in a very active way, their lives, their peer networks, their, their, their future selves were, were, should have been in a, going in a positive direction. So um, um, the first thing was to try to help them as soon as they began to struggle, you know, and, and the symptoms first appeared, the, the problems first appeared. And then to, to also make sure they got looked after properly during those early years after the diagnosis, because um, that we know now that those early years are, are critical for a whole range of reasons, just for them as people, but also for the course of the illness, the nature of the illness. It's, it's at its worst during those early years. It's a bit like children with asthma, young children with asthma. It's very sort of intense when they're young children and they kind of grow out of it and they mature out of it. Well, I think that can happen with, with people with serious mental illness. So we had to build a system because the old system was, was really, you know, very problematic. And that's what we have tried to do, and uh, we've had a lot of partnerships around the world trying to develop a new way of working with, with um, people with psychotic illness from the beginning. And, and mostly, as you can see from this picture here um, on the screen, um, yes. m mental illnesses or mental ill health, as I call it, um, is, is something that really takes off and becomes very strong during the years of um, adolescence and early adulthood. It's the main health problem. This, this slide shows the health spectrum across the lifespan and uh, you see that um, in late life from 50 plus and this is probably your knee that we're talking about here um, in later life we get more health problems and physical health problems and in, in younger children there are physical health problems too but uh, increasing well it is increasing that's true y it is increasing but um the but point medical facility improved why that's a qu that's a question i wanted to ask you a little bit later <laughs> <laughs> But I think the point to make at the moment, Your Holiness, is, is that um, this is the main health problem affecting young people and we haven't got a system of health care or, or health and social care to, to respond to that. That's what we have tried to build in recent years in Australia and that's what Natasha was referring to um, in our work. We've gone beyond the psychoses and, and schizophrenia into the whole of mental health in young people and why are they becoming unwell, why are they developing these health problems in such numbers. Um, 
and, and also building a system. While we're trying to understand why this is happening, we have to help them. We have to respond in a way which is um, a holistic way. Um, so, in other words, we, we try to understand their developmental and cultural issues. We have to build environments where they can go and feel comfortable. Mostly, the health system doesn't provide that. It provides good things for little kids and good things for older people, but, but not much for, 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 the, for the young people. And so we have to build a new system, and that's what we've been doing. And the government, coming back to the politicians, is supporting that uh, across the political spectrum now. Um, they're supporting something called Headspace, which is a national head, Headspace. It's a national youth mental health uh, sort of initiative. And these are, I suppose, they're like youth environments, but they also, as well as being um, culturally appropriate for young people, they, they have expertise. They have doctors and psychologists and, you know, vocational workers and... There should be a spiritual dimension to it too, actually. So, so th this is um, a culture we're trying to build and it's getting a lot of support from the public. The reason the politicians are, are responding to this, their, their mirror neurons are working, you know, um, is because the public, the Australian yeah. people, yes. have really you know, got behind this in a very strong way and, and we ha we've got a great opportunity for reform in this, in this, in this, in this place. But you know, uh, the, the problem that we have, and this is the question I wanted to ask you, um, is um, it is an activist agenda. You know, so w we are, it's driven by, I think, compassion by a lot of people you know, um, you know, that I work with and, and uh, you know, leaders in the field too. But um, there's a lot of opposition to it. You know, we, we do have enemies to this because it's changing the status quo. It's saying what we're doing is not good enough. You know, it's trying to reform something. And that's the thing I sometimes struggle with. How to deal with that? How, how, do, we, how do we keep it positive? How do we, you know, present this benign optimism to, to the enemies as well as the, um, the, uh, the people that we're trying to help. And um, how can we, um, I don't know, some of them may be able to, to change the way they think, but maybe some people can't. But, but um, that's a, a challenge because it's the resistance, which I know you, you have struggled with as well, you know, um, with, with your work. How, does, how do we deal with that? That's, that's my str struggle, I suppose. Okay, Philip. I always was telling people or sharing people is reality always changing. Uh, and our perception still remains old way of thinking. I think now, now here it is reality. Uh, here, I think young people the atmosphere or the environment the lot of fasting material development so a lot of sort of comp competition or competitive sort of sense and there are lot more sort of pressure uh, uh, mentally you see So therefore, uh, I think the I think the, the, that is also the problem. If you investigate, I think y youth in big city, youth in farmland. Do you think some differences? Yes, yeah, very much so. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that the, the, the young people in the rural communities um, it's probably been happening for some time. We know that there are higher suicide rates in, in, in rural communities, and it seems to be that those communities well, suicide more more in rural area. Yes. Oh, and, and, and then I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It's a little different. Now right? here, I think the education, the ru whether rural area or the uh, urban area, it mm. is the same sort of education system. Mm. So the rural area also has the opportunity to see more sort of the uh, material values. Yeah. So they want copy or follow or acquire these things. Then the condition, uh, their own place, their own area, less sort of uh, facility. Mm -hmm. Then maybe their desire reach very high, but actual facility, not that way. So that also is possible. And anyway, I think they, 
real environment situation much change. Mm. So mm. we have to tackle that according to that new reality. Mm. So just provide uh, the physical care. Since many of these problems is due to emotional way, so we have to you see, take uh, its own way to tackle these things. Just uh, taking care of the physical, not adequate, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Oh, so maybe that. I, I think um, I, th there's a higher rate of psychosis and, and, and uh, schizophrenia in. Psychosis, in psychosis, in psychosis, in psychosis. psychosis uh, psychotic symptoms where there's a suspension of reality. Uh, Pat can explain, of course. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's delusions and uh, hallucinations. Psychosis. Psychosis. Ah. Uh, uh, very, oh. very strong. Dimu. Dimu. Very strong. Yes. So that that is more common in cities, in big cities. That is more common in big cities. But um, you know, depression maybe, um, and suicide is more common in rural areas. And this may be because there's less help and services in those areas. So when people are becoming depressed, they can't get any help. Um, on the other hand. In, in Australia and, and, and I think a lot of other countries, there's a breakdown of the society in, in, the, in, the, in the rural areas. So that, you know, the, for example, the local football team, you know, um, has closed, you know, uh, isn't, isn't able to, to, to operate. And a lot of, lot of um, the things that held country towns together in Australia are, are sort of falling apart. So the social cohesion is being affected. So that might be another explanation. But I think otherwise, um, we d we, we're puzzled as to why there's an increase in problems in young people. Um, it could have to do with increasing materialism. I was talking to Alan earlier about this. Um, I think the increased materialism and the loss of a kind of a, a sort of a set of values and, and uh, for life, really, be because there's been a decline in traditional religions. Um, that's one possibility. Um, and I'm not saying that, that um, there's pluses and minuses, maybe, but, but the, the young people, I have uh, three sons who are in this age group, and you see that they, their lives are sort of more more difficult because of this lack of uh, a pathway and um, also they take longer to grow up you know so you know 40 years ago you were an adult at, you know maybe at 18 but certainly in your early 20s mm. nowadays you're not really a fully functioning adult until the late 20s so there's a longer period of, of maturation in the social sense and the brain too Marco could comment on this the, but the brain is changing very 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 subtly during this period too so it's a period of vulnerability, you know, yeah. and if it goes wrong, then um, there's no safety net for the young people. Your Holiness, and uh, what Pat's suggesting there really speaks and resonates with your great commitment to encouraging education around secular ethics yes. to bring meaning to young people's lives. How do we do that, do you think, in a way that isn't overly moralistic? or overly judgmental, but, but reaches into a young person's life where they are at, where they are at, meeting them halfway, if you like. For example, I know this month you gave some teachings to a whole large crowd of Tibetan young people um, I think earlier this month you gave a workshop or teachings to teenagers. So I'm interested, from Pat's experience too, how you approach your conversation with young people, young Tibetans, for example. No, I'm not a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we Tibetan ourselves also now need you see, a certain sort of, sort of uh, uh, proper way of educating. Again, among the, the, uh, the scholars, the scholars, I think this side, I think some, <laughs> some of the monks there, <laughs> I think they, uh, now we also need you see, the certain sort of new technique uh, uh, educate the younger generation. Uh, it's not sort of the proper, we simply our own sort of way of study traditional way, uh, firstly, learn by heart. My own case, 
as a six, seven year old, I already started learning by heart <laughs> without knowing the meaning. <laughs> so now we need see some kind of how should say, practical, realistic sort of approach. So that we need more study, more research work in America, in Canada, in also Europe. You see, in many of our conferences, you see, talk, and also my public talk, I always you see, mention existing modern education system is very much sort of materialistic sort of education, mm. uh, very much lead with uh, external things. Mm. Uh, I have the view the uh, last few centuries, you see, the science and technology developed. And that really brought a lot of, sort of our need immediately. In the past, when the people sick, pray to God. <laughs> uh, now modern time, some sort of some sort of sick come. Yes, they, they not only just as a oh, one sort of as a uh, physician, but each different field some specialist, called specialist for eyes, specialist for ear, specialist for heart, like that. So the, uh, what's the, day? so the, uh, uh, what we need uh, when we face problem, the science and technology really bring answer immediately. So then, uh, our interest mainly material values. Then the whole education, I think last few centuries, education system itself you know, oriented about that way. So now, the, I feel uh, later part of 20th century, the people begin to feel Material development alone will not provide all our sort of, sort of requirement. Uh, there is limitation. As far as mental crisis is concerned, material value cannot sort of cope with that problem. Uh, so, so among the, uh, I always is telling people, uh, among the wealthier people, could be some billionaire. As far as material facility is concerned, plenty. Mm. But as a person, very unhappy person, I notice sometimes these people also seeking some kind of uh, say they, uh, inner peace. They sort of uh, inquire what's the method to bring inner peace. Uh, then the, science, the field of the, sort of the science also, now, as, as you already sort of notice the uh, whether you whether we pinpoint clearly about mind or emotion the, it is quite troublesome <laughs> so we have to deal with that although invisible uh, we cannot see we cannot measurement but it is fact really troublemaker <laughs> so now how to deal with these emotions so, so therefore, now I think this in this field of science also now begin to show more sort of interest, more eagerness to further investigation about emotion, how to deal with these emotions. And you, you also mentioned that. So I think uh, healthy science. So therefore, uh, our existing education system, very much materialistic, aiming material development, that's not adequate. So we must mm, invent, uh, uh, introduce, you see, the education for warm heartedness. But what kind of sort of way, I don't know. Yes. And that I have no experience. Yes. So like these people and Alan, these people uh, and some other, I think should carry some further research work uh, how to introduce in modern education system about the 
uh, education about one party means. Mm -hmm. Then one school uh, carry experiment as an experiment. Uh, then judge few years, say four years, five years. Some or say the concrete sort of result happen, then can expand uh, ten schools, hundred schools. Then eventually, uh, ministry education ministry can uh, introduce a certain sort of new product, kind new, new curriculum like that. So I like that. Pat, that that's a great point because Pat's very much involved in working across the population now with young people. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Pat, and I'd also love to hear your thoughts in response to His Holiness about mm. whether mindfulness practices mm. have a place in adolescents, in young people. Sure. Um, well, Your Holiness, um, what you were saying just then about how to educate um, um, young people in, in, a, in a more positive way, there, there, there are moves in Australia in some places um, and it seems to be getting more momentum to introduce this idea of positive psychology into the school environment. Um, now that's great, you know, except it's coming from a very individualistic you know, tradition, I, I think. Um, and, and it doesn't, I don't think, my understanding of it, bring in the concern for the other, you know, the compassionate and the, the warm-heartedness. Um, it's very focused on you and your positive psychology. And that's my kind of problem with, with, it, with it, I suppose. Um, and I, I think it's a very healthy sort of idea in general to pursue and, 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 a, and as you say, to learn how to do it. How do you stimulate the, the more compassionate focus? And we don't really know how to do that, I don't think, yet in schools. But the other side of the coin is what I see, because I'm a, a doctor and a clinician, I'm very concerned about the other side of the coin, the, 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 this the children and, and the young people who, despite you know uh, every best effort around positive psychology, are still developing in very large numbers uh, clear-cut mental ill health for which they need help, and the fact that there's no mechanism to pick that up and, and, and support them, probably remaining in the environment they're in, in the school, or and helping them recover in that environment rather than taking them out and putting them somewhere else. And so that's the, these are the challenges. There's two sides of the same coin, I think. You know. What you what you were speaking about, which I think would have very positive effects on everything, actually, you know, and what I what I spoke about when I started my career, how I saw just everywhere negativity and pessimism, and, and we have to replace that in, with a much more positive uh, attitude to life and to 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 the people we're trying to help. And I feel that to work with young people, you have to have that sort of kind of love for them. You know, you have to feel that for them. Otherwise, you can't you can't work effectively and. All the people that I know that do work in this area, and there's increasing numbers, have got that. They've got an affinity for the young people, and also to give them a voice. You know, I, in, in terms of solving the problem, we have to listen to them and get their voice heard. I think there's room full of consensus on that point, <laughs> Alan. Ellen yes, Ellen. I, I know you have something to say. I think he has much to say. I know you've uh, been experience. drawing yeah. together many of the threads today. Um, so I'd love your thoughts on some of the themes that have come up today. Is there anything you, any kernel you'd like to, to explore? I always have thoughts. <laughs> sure. There have been so many themes here, and I would like, indeed, because I've been taking notes, trying to kind of weave myself some of the topics that have come up. His Holiness' initial emphasis on this cultivation of human values, keeping up with the knowledge and the power that we get by, si by scientific knowledge and technology, the whole theme of genuine happiness being spiritual, and then related issues came up about, for example, you're, you're pointing, asking whether sadness is compatible with genuine happiness, and what about corrupt people who seem to be doing very well, really enjoying their lives, their mansions, and so forth and so on, and, and then finally coming to the points that you're making, Patrick, about the troubles, I mean, that this, this chart that you've given us. I think to try to just focus on one theme that will connect with all of the above, His Holiness has given something of a definition of genuine happiness as a type of satisfaction mm -hmm. that endures, that is cultivated. And I'd like to simply elaborate a bit further on that because, and we come to education too, 
and this is where the really, it has such a point, it puts a sharp edge to it, and that is to draw a, sh a clear distinction between the type of happiness that arises, happiness, pleasure, joy, that arises because of some stimulation or something good happening to us. The miken, miken na tene, or ene jitenbe dewa. So something that is arising because of an objective stimulus. And so people who are very corrupt may be surrounded by a lot of stimuli that give them pleasure, you know, great entertainment and all that other kind of thing. But we have that hedonic well-being that arises independent upon stimulation. But this genuine happiness, I would suggest, arises without the external support or stimulation. And so if we look at this in the Buddhist context, but I think it is also universal, that there is a quality of genuine happiness, yang dape dewa in Tibetan, that arises by leading a truly ethical way of life, a benevolent way of life, an altruistic, a caring, a loving way of life. And so this is a quality of well-being that comes not from what we're getting from the world, but from what we're bringing to the world. And so when it's something that arises because of what we bring to the world, no one can take it away. If you've been kind in the morning to another person and afterwards you feel, you feel a contentment, a kind of satisfaction about that, no one can take it away, right? Whereas for the corrupt person who, uh, who's, whose happiness is all derived upon getting things from the world, take away all that support. Take away all the support. Put them in a room by themselves and now see how happy they are. Now, I've lived with yogis, and His Holiness knows many of these, who will live in solitude for years or even decades on end in the most primitive, simple, s simple situation. So happy. Again, Chamo Wonjit, for example. Mm -hmm. One yogi, His Holiness knows, I know, living in such simplicity. One would think, this is torture, this is, this is punishment to live in such a circumstance. Mm -hmm. Almost no food, no, you know, very little food and so forth, but such happiness. So I think a distinction can be made that I find very useful, and that is this hedonic pleasure that arises independence upon stimulation, and that's not really yours. Because take away the stimulation, you don't have it anymore. Genuine happiness coming from ethics. Genuine happiness coming from really cultivating your mind. That's gom, or bhavana is called in Sanskrit. Cultivating your heart and mind, even without actively interacting with other people. You can live in solitude and be very happy because how, of how you've cultivated your mind through Samadhi, through the cultivation of loving kindness, compassion, you can do that on your own. And then His Holiness spoke also of overcoming mental afflictions through really investigating the nature of reality. So another level of happiness. Another sense of genuine happiness that comes from deepening insight, really understanding the nature of our own minds, our own identity, our relationship with the world, and so multiple dimensions of genuine happiness. As there are multiple dimensions of genuine happiness, there are also multiple dimensions of distress or unhappiness that arises which in independence upon stimulation. So you ask whether a person who is truly flourishing can feel sad. The answer is definitely. I've mm -hmm. seen his holiness weep on a number of occasions mm -hmm. for very good reason. But while he was weeping, if I may speak for his experience, which is audacious, at the same time he's flourishing. This was not then a break in his spiritual mm -hmm. practice. It was not an interruption. So one way feels sad and flourish at the same time, right? So there's hedonic distress that is aroused because when something very sad has happened. But we also know a person could be sitting in a room by him or herself with no stimulation and be totally miserable. That's genuine unhappiness. <laughs> and the wealthy person can have that. The poor person can have that. You don't need any help for that because it's all coming from what you are bringing to the world. And what you're bringing to the world is afflictive. And so if I would end on the point of education and also this complementarity, we are so, we stand so much in awe, in the, we in the modern world, not everybody, but so much in awe of the tremendous triumphs of scientific inquiry. 400 years and the exponential growth of knowledge, especially in the last century, we stand in awe of this, even to the point that many people in the modern world think that's, it's only if something is scientifically validated that it's true. And so we wait, we meditate, we meditate, and then we say, then we ask the scientists, is it working? You know, trying to get their validation. This is a type of, I call it methodolatry. Thinking that only one method 
the scientific method, is the only way to know what's going on. Well, we, we heard from an eminent scientist, I'm pointing to the screen where I saw him, Paul Lechman, tremendous success as a scientist. And his last point that he made was, there are things that we know to be true that we have not yet been able to, and maybe never, he didn't say, but maybe never will be able to validate through this objective, quantitative, physical measurements that science is so good at. And so this is the point, and the final point, of, of complementarity, that there are many things that we, can be, that we can discover, that we can know with certainty without resorting to objective, external, physical measures. This is the complementarity His Holiness is speaking about. There are ways of training the mind, balancing the mind with concentration, with samadhi, with insight, with analysis, that you can really gain legitimate, authentic, replicable insights, discoveries without relying upon the methods of modern science. This doesn't mean they're incompatible, it does mean they're complementary. And that's what we're waiting for. So I've participated in many scientific studies of meditation with top-notch scientists, but almost invariably, when the resort results come out, it's always the scientists reporting on what they discovered, they never report <laughs> on what the meditators discovered. <laughs> As if there's only one side of professionals here. So, this is not a battle. This is not a competition. It but there be needs to be that two-way dialogue. That's the two-way dialogue. And and it's, and the language is always not common, though, is it? It's not common, but we have people who want to see a win-lose situation. We have materialist fundamentalists, atheist fundamentalists, that think religion has to lose, and we win because they're wrong and we're right. Then we have religious fundamentalists. We are right, and anybody who disagrees with us, including scientists and atheists, they're wrong. Somebody wins, somebody loses. It's very wrong-headed, and it will never happen. The complementarity of recognizing there's not just one method, not just meditation, not just science, complementarity. And if we brought this into education, not bringing Buddhism, mm. but training young, young people how to really become scientists of their own experience and ask through their own experience, what truly makes me happy? What truly makes me suffer? Many things may contribute as the mikien, as the outer conditions. Something happens, I feel happy. Something else happens, I feel unhappy. Oh, that always happens. But Alan, if we worked all that out in our teen years, what would we do for the rest of our lives? Live a, live a meaningful <laughs> life. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Wallace. Ah. That was beautiful. What a great summation of the discussion today. Your Holiness, Marco and Pat, would you like to uh, add any reflections at this point? I'll start. Um, I think that I agree with many things that you said. And uh, I think that one way of looking at it is, in fact, is we have different viewpoints. And we see the world only from our own viewpoint. But I think that empathy is one, actually one capacity that makes us see things from the viewpoint of other people. And so being open to that, being receptive, use your imagination to see how other people see the world. It's first of all a phenomenal thing because it enriches your own life. Mm -hmm. It also creates this dialogue in our society that is so important. It's a beautiful thing. I think that I'm um, painfully aware that there are many, ac many other things in, an, in our societies that, that actually work against that. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, one thing that we had seen in the Western world is that Governments are mostly owned by corporations. Corporations are made by people, but they're not people. So corporations will never be able to empathize. And that's a problem. A problem that is, in a way, affecting the way we actually are living our own life. Certainly, you know, the things you said, you can always find your own inner thoughts. You can always, you know, I like your, your idea that, you know, if you put somebody in a room with nothing else, you see whether that person is internally happy. But of course our life is not about being alone in a, in a room. It's about interacting with others. And so we have to find a way that this interaction becomes really meaningful and rich and positive. Pat. Well, uh, I just think I've, I've learned uh, so much from just being part of this and listening. And, and um, the things that I've, I've learned are, I think, that this Id the, the idea, the value of compassion and uh, empathy is something that's been under attack a lot. In our, in especially in Australia, I think in recent times, mm. and I'm thinking of asylum seekers and refugees, our, our, our failure to actually <laughs> respond to that. 
so I wish that, I really wish that could be turned around and I think it, it can only be done with moral force and by tapping into the inherent goodness yeah. of, of people in, in Australia. Australians aren't uncompassionate but they've been led down a very bad path in recent years and I'd like to see that path reversed. It's a, it's a separate issue but it's a very important one for us as, as Australians. Um, we feel bad about ourselves because of the way we're behaving and we don't seem to be able to turn it around so that's one thought. But I loved uh, Alan's co comment about complementarity, you know, because, you know, in, in the battles that we fight to get better services, we have this ideological stuff all the time. You know, people get painted as, you know, using one type of therapy or another type of therapy, or there's, there's a lot of um, ideological heat in this area because of the unwillingness to embrace a number of different perspectives about the young people that we're working with, you know. We see their brains, we see their lives, we see their personalities and their futures. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I would have loved to have been like Alan in the sense to, to have sorted all this out when I was 21 and, and, and not to spend my whole life doing it, <laughs> like Natasha <laughs> was saying. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, to, to live a, a, that, a, 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 that type of life and to help people to yeah. find that as soon as possible is, is, is the challenge, I yeah. guess, as you said. And it's been such a privilege to be part of this. Thank you, Your Holiness. Holiness, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing this dialogue. May we do it again soon. I think this kind of, uh, I think the discussion or discussion actually is the investigation. A certain problem which we are facing. Uh, now we have to find ways and means to reduce this problem. So my, my belief is my usual philosophy thinking is uh, have some information of some practice in Buddhism there, you can take. Have the Christian uh, doctrine or Islam, something sort of uh, relevant thing, take. So our own sort of the way of sort of persuasion or way approach is must be uh, secular basis. So then it can be universal. If we uh, rely on religious faith, then that will never be universal. I think because of the India, India because of the thousand years, so many different religious traditions there. So, uh, Indian constitution based on secularism. Because of the reality, multi sort of religious sort of community. So, if you pick up one faith, it will not be, it will not cover or on that continent or the whole. So, therefore, now we, uh, when we talk about education, I mean. And finally, the, there are a lot of problems which our own creation. That's clear. Mm. Global level or individual level also, you see, a lot of sort of problems, our own sort of, sort of, that, uh, the sort of uh, due to lack of proper mental attitude. Uh, I think material development suddenly reduced the pains and pains for mainly related with sensorial sort of uh, consciousness or sensorial experience. Now certain problems which develop on mental level, uh, the facility which bring pleasure sort of experience on sensorial level won't help. That's very clear. Uh, so people who have some sort of problem in deeper level of mind, the seeing some spots. Uh, that short moment, uh, forget about that problem. <laughs> the beautiful, the beautiful music, uh, short moment, forget. But then stop that, again they worry. <laughs> Come. So now we must you see, tackle uh, the mental level itself. Wow. 
is the so that although all the all the sort of religious tradition nature tradition is dealing with that for example the concept of god reduce self centered sort of uh, attitude total sort of submission to god so very helpful very powerful uh, so all major religion tradition you see taking taking away tackle tackle that, that sort of problem bring more inner peace uh, in order to reduce the sources of inner sort of disturbances uh, but that will not be universal so we must find uh, universally sort of acceptable sort of certain way of spiritual not religion with religion uh, more education basis so that i think uh, now i think uh, australia i think almost first time mm, more serious discussion about that mm. at, at least in my my own sort of case so it is wonderful now uh, more serious discussion these things and then eventually the how to tackle this in these things in a practical way that's i think important so i'm very happy we already start something that's good so eventually uh, we will find some sort of proper way to tackle this problem mm. then individual become much peaceful happier and less quarrel with the family i think less devotion where divorce where divorce or less sort of divorce <laughs> in the family uh, and then maybe uh, hopefully less suicide <laughs> more sort of friendly society more compassionate society mm. that we can do through proper training you know yeah this is my view so it is our uh, uh, and also is i often is telling the our generation belongs to 20th century so our century already gone yeah, so, <laughs> so we don't remind me so, <laughs> so we now ready to say bye bye so our responsibility is our knowledge experience which we learn and travel to 20th century now must sort of cause of that share this younger generation now in order to build happy world peaceful world that ultimately uh, uh, depend on compassion so our target should be compassionate world how to build that that's my sort of fundamental belief and whenever i talk i always touch into that uh, and if we sort of put responsibility to religious group mm. very limited mm. Mm, unrealistic so we must sort of put our hope and responsibility to education system that's an uh, education so there must be uh, some sort of cause of that uh, some new sort of said a way to educate all mahanas well thank you for ins inspiring us with that possibility for australia your holiness thank you very much Thank, Thank you. you. To Alan Wallace, Pat McGorry, and Marco Iacoboni. Thank you. And thank you for being part of the discussion too.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that was a very, very special session this morning. And thanks once again to His Holiness, the panellists, and of course, Natasha, the moderator. Um, it was a really wonderful morning. Thank you again. <laughs>